This lesson is titled Origin of the Ideal Operational Amplifier Model. When I've introduced this model in class, just out of the blue, so to speak, it tends to meet with incredulity. Students often feel that something's just not right about it. No volts at the input, no current at the input. How can it be good for anything? How can one expect something to come from nothing? It violates intuition. In the course of this lesson, though, we wish to explore where this model comes from, the rationale behind it, to look at an example for how it's used in circuit analysis, and to gain an appreciation of the value of this model. Generally speaking, with operational amplifiers or op amps, we expect to have two input terminals, a non-inverting input and an inverting input. These are shown here with the voltage V sub P at the non-inverting input and the voltage V sub N at the inverting input. Also, there has to be an output terminal. And then there must also be a connection for a DC power supply or supplies. The op amp is an active device. It requires external power supplies to function. Now you may sometimes also find additional inputs on a specific op amp for offset adjustments. But what we see here is the essence of op amp terminals. This sketch shows the relationship between the output voltage on the vertical axis and the voltage drop across the input terminals, V sub P minus V sub N on the horizontal axis. There's a region where V sub out increases linearly with the difference between VP and VN and the saturation regions. Now the op amp can't exceed the positive DC supply in the positive direction, neither can it be more negative than the minus DC power supply. Just note that the ideal op amp model, which is the subject of this lesson, applies to the linear region of operation. And here we see the simplified schematic symbol that one often encounters in an op amp circuit schematic. One will find the inputs and outputs connected to other components in the circuit, but the DC power supplies are not explicitly shown. Of course, they have to be there or the whole thing won't work, but this is the schematic that we'll be using throughout this lesson as well. As a starting point for our discussion of circuit models for op amps, consider this model which we previously saw in the lesson titled, What are Dependent Sources? In that lesson, we discussed how the combined effect of the transistors and other components in the integrated circuit chip corresponding to the op amp, as well as the DC power supplies, can be modeled by three elements. An input resistance and an output resistance are two of them. And the third is the voltage-controlled voltage source, where A is the voltage gain. Conceptually, as shown here, the dependent source models how the flow of power from the power supplies is rooted to the output as directed by the input voltages, thanks to some very clever circuit design of the operational amplifier itself. Now, shown here is a circuit schematic for a commonly used op-amp application in which case the mathematical operation performed is to multiply an input signal by a constant. The input signal is represented here by the one volt source connected to the non-inverting input of the op amp. Well, let's replace the op amp model with that two resistor, one voltage controlled voltage source model that we just looked at in the previous slide and carry out the circuit analysis. In this schematic now, the op amp symbol has been replaced by the model with two resistors and a dependent source and we want to solve for the output voltage. Well, we could proceed with node voltage analysis or perhaps mesh current analysis, for example, but let's sp let SPICE do the work for us this time. And so the five nodes that we see here have been numbered for a SPICE text input file. And here is shown a screen capture of that SPICE input file. Note that it says what nodes the 1K resistor and 10K resistor are connected between and I've used some typical 741 op amp values for the input resistance and output resistance. Notice that the voltage controlled source is given a voltage gain of 100,000. That's also typical for the 741 op amp. Submit the input file and SPICE cheerfully responds after a few milliseconds with the node voltages and they are listed here. SPICE also gives us the current flowing into the one volt voltage supply using passive sign notation as it likes to do. You can see that it's in the 10 to the minus 11th amp range. And now let's put these numerical results from SPICE on the original circuit schematic and see what observations we can make. We see that the output voltage is equal to 10.999 volts or to within one millivolt, 11 volts. So the input voltage has been multiplied by 11. But I'd like to draw your attention to some of the other voltages and currents in this circuit. 
Well, observation number one. The node voltages at the inverting input and non-inverting input are almost the same. One is 1.0000, the other one is 0.9999. They only differ by 100 microvolts. Consider the implication of that in writing KVL around loops in this circuit. If we write Kirchhoff's voltage law around the loop that contains the voltage rise or voltage drop across the op-amp input terminals, we see in this circuit that that quantity would be orders of magnitude less than other voltages that appear in the KVL expression. So it could be neglected without any loss of accuracy of its significance. In other words, we can say VP minus VN is zero and only affect, for example, the fourth digit on the calculator. Next observation. Look at the current flowing into the op-amp input terminals, orders of magnitude smaller than other currents in the circuit. So let's say we pick a node that includes one of the inputs and we write Kirchhoff's current law at that node. The input current plays an entirely negligible role in the KCL equation. If we neglect the input currents entirely, it has no significant impact on the KCL equations. And it's from these two observations that the ideal op-amp model arises. The input current, though not identically equal to zero, is small enough to be neglected in Kirchhoff's current law. And the input voltage, though not identically zero, is small enough to be neglected in Kirchhoff's voltage laws. Now, in another lesson on this channel titled The Ideal Op-Amp Compared to a Real Op-Amp, an Experiment, we build an op-amp circuit. We measure the upper bounds on input voltages and currents for the op-amp and we find them to be in the millivolt and microamp or less regime, respectively, supporting the idea that they are negligible for most intents and purposes. These two facts result from the fact that the transistor circuitry of the op-amp has been designed such that it has a very high input resistance, requiring very little uh, input current, and very high voltage gain, requiring very little input voltage to achieve its desired purposes. Well, on to the second part of this lesson. Let's see how the ideal op-amp model can be used to analyze this circuit that multiplies the input voltage by a constant. Step one, because we're using the ideal op-amp model, we may write the input currents and input voltage as zero. We do so, and now let's use other element constraints plus Kirchhoff's current law and Kirchhoff's voltage law to find the output voltage. Writing KVL around the loop shown, for example, we have minus V sub 2 plus 0 plus 1 volt equal to 0. So the voltage drop across the 1K resistor is 1 volt. By Ohm's law, then, the current through that resistor, I sub 2, must be equal to 1 volt over 1 kilo ohm or 1 milliamp. So as the next step, consider that node shown with a circled dotted line around it. Let's write KCL at that node. Since we're neglecting the input current to the op-amp, it's simply I1 plus I2 is equal to zero, or I1 is equal to minus I2, or I1 is equal to minus one milliamp. Now that we've got the current through the 10K ohm resistor, we can get the voltage from Ohm's law. V1 is equal to I1 times 10K, or minus 10 volts. Now we're in a position to write KVL around a loop that contains the output voltage as the only unknown. So minus 1 volt, minus 0 volts, minus 10 volts, plus V out is equal to 0, or V out is equal to 11 volts. So by using the ideal op-amp model, plus simply Ohm's law, KCL, and KVL, we arrive at an answer rather quickly that for most intents and purposes is the same as the more sophisticated model used in the SPICE simulation. We know that in an actual op-amp circuit, the input currents and voltages are not truly zero, but when they're operating in the linear region with negative feedback, those parameters are often small enough to be safely ignored in applying KVL and KCL in circuit analysis. That really greatly simplifies circuit analysis and engineers frequently use that model when working with op-amps in the linear region. Well, let's summarize our lesson. The ideal op-amp model is also known as the zero volt, zero amp model. We take the input currents to be zero, and we take the difference between the node voltages at the inputs to be zero. Using these constraints plus KCL, KVL, and the current voltage, uh, 
constraints of other elements in the circuit, be they resistors or inductors, we arrive at the variables of interest in the circuit. This concludes our lesson on the ideal op-amp model and its origin. I thank you very much once again for watching.